Good morning. Uh, welcome to statistics. We are actually uh, going to continue uh, uh, the session uh, with the um, one-way ANOVA computation. We're going to do a few more computations today and today will be the end of the one-way ANOVA computations. Uh, this session should last maybe mm, 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, we have a scenario here. Let's take a look at it. This is a problem out of social psychology on hazing in sororities and fraternities. Joanne is conducting a social psychology experiment on the effects of initiation on group attraction. Her hypothesis is that subjects experiencing a severe group initiation, an embarrassing task, in order to join the group will eventually come to like that group more than subjects going through a moderate in a mild initiation process, less embarrassing situation. Subjects were randomly assigned to one of three treatment initiation conditions. Following the initiation task, all subjects were asked to rate their attraction to the group they were about to join. So the dependent variable in this case is attraction, group attraction. Zero equals none, 10 is a great deal. Self-reported attraction to the group it wants to test her, us to test her hypothesis at the O5 alpha level. Her hypothesis, now look at the data very closely. Remember I said, the first thing you do is look at the data. Her hypothesis is that students experiencing a severe initiation uh, task will actually be more attracted to the group as compared to the other groups, moderate and mild. Well, lo look at the data. Look, it appears anyway that the group experience in the severe initiation task is like less attracted to the group. This is a smaller number than this and this. So immediately, class, her hypothesis is refuted. It's, it's, she's essentially wrong, which is fine. You know, we're right sometimes, we're wrong sometimes. We're right a lot and we're wrong a lot. It's just the way it is. But now, our job is to determine, you know, th this number is the largest number in terms of the means. So we might develop what we call a rival hypothesis that states, you know what, you know, you know, or a question, is the group that receives the mild initiation task significantly more attracted to the group than all the others? You know, is there a significant difference here? You know, I don't, I don't know. You know, what I do know is that it's, 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 it's dependent on where our particular F statistic falls on that F sampling distribution. If it falls out in the tail, we can actually reject the null and say that that F event is a rare enough event to be deemed a significant event. If the F falls in the middle somewhere, we're going to accept the null and conclude that that event is just common, common everyday stuff. Nothing extraordinary going on. Now again, we have a three group null and a three group alternative. No difference, there is a difference. This problem calls for an O5 alpha. We know that before we run any statistical test, our P equals alpha. In this case, we have three groups. So G equals 3, capital N sub T is 21, the total number of subjects, 3 times 7 is 21. Degrees of freedom between is G minus 1, 3 minus 1 is 2, degrees of freedom within groups, capital N sub T minus G, uh, 21 minus 3 is 18. We have 2 and 18 degrees of freedom. 2 between 18 within. If you'd like to add these two, that would be fine. They do it in the book. I don't do it myself. Doesn't really matter. 2 and 18 degrees of freedom. At an O5 alpha, we can find a critical value. We turn to the back of our books to page C26. That is the O5 alpha page. 
in terms of the F sampling distribution. We go across the top to 2, down the side to 18. There's a number there. Match them up. 3.55. The number is 3.55. We know that if F exceeds this, we have enough evidence to reject the null. This is also telling us, in this particular case, with 2 and 18 degrees of freedom, about 5% of our area under this particular F sampling distribution falls to the right of this number, right? About 95% of the area under this particular F sampling distribution falls to the left of this number. We said we have to get the data set ready to actually do the partitioning, which is the actual computation. We do this partitioning, remember, in the form of sums of squares. We're partitioning variation. We're, we're segmenting it. We're chopping it up. We have to do a, ser a series of summations. We do a sum x for each group and a sum x squared for each group. Um, sum x for our first group is 21. Sum x for our second group is 28. Sum x for our third group is 45. Simple summations. Now we do a sum x squared for each group. 3 squared plus 0 squared plus 5 squared plus 2 squared plus 1 squared plus 7 squared plus 3 squared gives us a sum x squared for group 1 of 97. Sum x squared for group 2, 168. Sum x squared for group 3, 333. We now proceed to summation totals. A sum x total, a sum x squared total, and then we take this quantity sum x total and square that per these instructions. Sum x sub t, this plus this plus this gives us 94. Sum x squared sub t, this plus this plus this gives us 598. And then we take this quantity 94 and square it per these instructions. 94 squared, 88.36. And we are ready to go. We can compute our sums of squares. We can proceed with the partitioning activity. The first step here is to compute the sum of squares total, which is the sum x squared total minus this sum x squared sub t quantity squared over the capital N sub t. And we now have all the ingredients to be able to do that. Sum x squared sub t 598 minus the sum x sub t quantity squared, 88.36, over the capital N sub t, 21. This becomes 598 minus this quantity. 88.36 divided by 21 is 420.76. Sum of squares total is 177.24. We take this number, we put it where it belongs. SST, 177.24. Our next step, sum of squares between groups. Uh, on the final exam, of course, uh, all your formulas will be provided for you. You don't have to uh, memorize these. So we take our ingredients again and we plug in. Sum of squares between groups. Uh, the sum x for the first group, 21. Quantity squared over the n of 7 plus the sum x for the second group, 28. Quantity squared over 7, plus the same for the third group, 45. Quantity squared over n of 7, close the bracket, 
minus this quantity right here, which is actually this quantity right here, which we already computed to be 420.76. Let's put that in there. We now have, again, a bunch of arithmetic, simple arithmetic. Uh, if we square each one of these numerators and divide by 7, we get the number 464.29 minus our 420.76. Sum of squares between groups, in this case, is 43.52. Bless you. A lot of sneezing going around these days. This is nothing to sneeze at. A um, little comedy in this real dry stat lecture. Um, SSB 43.52. We put this where it belongs. And we can now kind of sit back and take a breath. And we actually you know, do what this thing tells us to do. You know, <clears throat> between plus within equals total, we can actually get this um, SSW pretty simply by simply saying total sums of squares minus between group sums of squares. So we say 177.24 minus our 43.52. Sum of squares within, in this case, 133.71. Or something pretty close. And we put this where it belongs, 133.71. And you notice we're a little off here in terms of addition, but don't worry about that. It's just as a result of rounding, whatever. Close enough. Now we do what this thing instructs us to do. SS divided by DF equals MS. We know this mean square is something really similar to a variance, right? It's not a variance per se, but something pretty similar. Uh, this divided by this, uh, 21.76. This divided by this, 7.43. And we know the F statistic is the ratio of the mean square between divided by the mean square within. So it's just simply uh, 21.76 divided by 7.43. F in this case is 2.93. F is 2.93. We have a decision to make. Just like we always do, we compare the calculated test statistic to the critical value. We see that it does not exceed it. Therefore, our decision in this case is to do what? Accept the null. Accept the null. Yeah. Accept this statement, <coughs> which states that there's no difference in the population. One of our conclusions now is that, you know what? You know, despite the fact that we have this sample mean difference, uh, we really don't have enough evidence to conclude that it's real. Probably just happened by chance. What's most likely happening is that there's no difference on group attraction relative to these three groups. There's no difference. They're all equally as attracted to their particular, you know, fraternity or whatever. Um, what is our next step here, class? We would stop. We are pretty much done with this analysis. We have a non-significant F statistic. And we would just stop, and we now just do a little bit of cleanup work. Uh, let's address P. What happened to P? Right, it got bigger. If P is greater than alpha, we would accept the null. The P region actually got bigger because the needle shifted from the 355 back to 293. It actually made that area of P larger. We know 
that when we accept the null, this alpha is kind of like a non-issue, right? So the likelihood I made a type 1 error is a non-issue, but there's a small chance we know that I may have made a type 2 error. It's a small little chance. Um, we accepted the null. What was the reason? Power. Power is always the reason. In this case, a lack of power. Let's take a look at it. Well, we have a pretty standard alpha here. It's kind of like a vanilla ice cream cone from the Dairy Queen. Pretty, pretty standard, you know. Uh, we, we don't have a whole lot of power here in terms of our sample size. Pretty small sample sizes, right? And as it turns out, we don't quite have enough between group variation combined with a little bit too much within group variation. It made our F statistic non-significant. So in this case, as always, these four things combined, in this case, produced, produced an F that was non-significant. So it's always a power issue. Between groups variation, within groups variation, sample size, and alpha. The four elements of statistical power. Okay, um, let's proceed to the um, uh, problem on the partial reinforcement extinction effect. Get that problem out and um, draw an ANOVA table on the back. It'll just take me a second to get this thing set up. This next problem is out of uh, behavioral psychology. It's actually really interesting. Let's take a look at it. One of the well-known effects in psychology is the partial reinforcement extinction effect. It's a theory called PRE. Stated simply, the behavior of a person who has been reinforced on a random or partial basis is more persistent than subjects continuously reinforced. This is a theory that suggests, and I'm sure a lot of you can relate to this, especially if you're athletes. If I praise someone too much, this theory asserts that if I praise someone too much, their behavior isn't going to be as consistent or persistent as if I just praise you once in a while. What this implies is that if I, if I pat you on the back too much, you're gonna think that you're just like so great that you don't need to work anymore and you're not going to be as motivated to achieve as if I were just to praise you maybe a, once or twice a week. Like when the coach, you know, just like out of the blue says, hey, you know, good job, man. You know, it's like, where did that come from? Gee, I think I'm going to work harder to get more praise. All right? This effect can be applied to a wide variety of settings. This particular example is out of education. This is actually educational psychology. Imagine that a teacher wants to study the effects of partial reinforcement on children's persistence. So again, this is an experiment. The reinforcement schedule is the IV, children's persistence is the DV. The teacher wants students to work on hard math problems without much supervision, and she wants them to be persistent. She selects 16 children from a fifth grade class and randomly assigns each to one of four treatment conditions. In group one, the subjects receive a reinforcer for each math problem they solve. In group two, the subjects receive a reinforcer for a random 80% of the problems. In three and four, the subjects receive a reinforcer for a random 60% and 40% of the problems, respectively. After a week of training, the reinforcement is withheld. The teacher gives the students 12 math problems to solve and counts the number of problems they solve before quitting. So the DV 
in this case is the number of problems solved before quitting. The data on the four groups are presented below. It wants an O5 alpha. Does this data provide further confirming scientific evidence for the validity of pre? Let's take a look at this. Just to review a little bit, we have a four group, one way ANOVA design, right? We have one factor A with four levels. Reinforcement for every problem they solve. Reinforcement for 80% of the problems they solve. Reinforcement for 60% of the problems they solve. And so on and so forth. One factor A with four treatment levels. These are the numbers. Very quickly, 4213, 4, subjects in each group. The mean of group one is 2.5. Group two's mean is 4.5. The mean of group three, 5.5. Group four's mean is six with four subjects in each group. The hypothesis was that as reinforcement decreases, persistence will increase. Look at the data here. Reinforcement is decreasing. Persistence is increasing. Based on what we know back from descriptive stat, we have this going on. What is this? That's a negative correlation. Well, that's pretty cool. Well, we're not actually working with that right now, but we definitely have something going on here. You know, the group that's praised the last, the less, is being more persistent. Look at this. Wow. Empirical evidence. We have a four group null hypothesis and a four group alternative hypothesis. This thing calls for an O5 alpha. We know that before we run any statistical test, our P equals alpha. Degrees of freedom, let's see, G is four, correct? Four groups, capital N sub T is 16. Degrees of freedom between groups is G minus one. Four minus one is three. Degrees of freedom within groups, capital N sub T minus G. 16 minus four is 12. We have three and 12 degrees of freedom, three between. 12 within, 3 and 12 degrees of freedom. We can find a critical value. We go to page C26 in the back of our books, across the top to 3, down the side to 12. There's a number there. 3.49. We know that if f exceeds this critical value, we have enough evidence to reject the null. Again, we now have to get the data set ready to be able to do this computation, to do this partitioning. And again, we do a sum x for each of our groups. And a sum x squared for each of our groups. Let's 
simple summations. Sum x for the first group is 10, for the second group 18, for the third group 22, sum x for our fourth group is 24. Simple summations. We now proceed to sum x squared. 4 squared plus 2 squared plus 1 squared plus 3 squared gives us sum x squared for the first group of 30. Second group 86. Sum x squared for the third group 126. For the fourth group 150. We now proceed to the summation totals. Again, we do a sum x total, a sum x squared total, and then we take this quantity sum x sub t, and we're going to square that. We're just going to bring everything over to totals because we know that we're dealing with totals in this piece, of course. Sum x sub t, this plus this plus this plus this is 74. Sum x sub t is 74. This plus this plus this plus this is 392. And then we take this 74 quantity and square it. 74 squared, 54, 76. And again, we're ready to go. We can now begin our partitioning. SST is the sum x squared sub t minus the sum x sub t quantity squared over the capital N sub t. This is a, this is a sum of squares. So let's fill in. Uh, sum x squared sub t 392 minus the sum x sub t quantity squared 5476 over the capital N sub t of 16. And we'll just bring this baby down. 392. This divided by this is 342.25. <clears throat> Sum of squares total, 49.75. We'll take that number and we'll put it where it belongs. SST 49.75. Very good. Our next step, sum of squares between groups. And we'll just expand our formula a little bit to include this fourth group. And we see we have a lot of, of course, busy work and filling in the blanks and blah, blah, blah. Let's do that. The sum of squares between groups. Uh, sum x for the first group would be 10 squared over 4 plus the second group, 18 squared over 4 plus the sum x for the third group, uh, 22 squared over 4, plus the same for the fourth group, <clears throat> 24 squared, over 4, close the bracket, open up the next one, <clears throat> that's this piece right here, which is actually this piece right here, which we already computed to be 342.25. So again, we have some arithmetic busy work. And if we square each of these numerators and divide by 4, we get the number 371 minus our 342.25. The sum of squares between groups is 28.75.
28.75, and we take this number, we put it where it belongs. SSB, 28.75. We're uh, actually almost done here. We can, we can coast now a little bit. We know that this plus this equals this. We can actually add these two numbers together, that's fine. Uh, this plus this equals this. So we know that SSW is the total sum of squares minus the between group sum of squares. Uh, 49.75 minus 28.75 gives us a within group sum of squares of 21. 21. And we will put that where it belongs. SSW 21. This plus this equals this. You see this is a little off because of rounding in the whole process. No problem. And now we just do what this thing tells us to do. SS divided by DF equals MS. This divided by this, 9.58. This divided by this, 1.75. The F statistic, again, is the ratio of between over within. In this case, 9.58 over 1.75. F in this case is 5.47. F is 5.47. We have a decision. And you notice this is pretty repetitious, isn't it? We're getting our reps in. That's good. This is exactly what we need. And you know, we get the reps in, what happens? We get better. You get better. You know, it's just the way it goes. You gotta put the time in. We compare the calculated statistic to the critical value. We see that it exceeds it. Therefore, our decision in this case would be to do what? We would reject the null. Yeah. <coughs> What happened to the P region? It yeah, it got smaller. If P is less than alpha, we reject the null. Let's, let's, um, let's go back to our little question here. We're now, we now have the ability to answer it. Does this data provide further confirming scientific evidence for the validity of PRE? Yeah. Yeah, it appears. We have some statistical evidence now that suggests that, you know what? As reinforcement decreases, level of persistence, and, you know, as measured by the number of problems solved before quitting, actually increases. Well, you know, we've computed a significant omnibus F, haven't we? We've computed this indicator of overall significance between our groups. But it's not telling us specifically where the significant differences are. So we have a next step here, don't we? And what do we call that? The post hoc test. There are a number of them to select. There's actually four popular ones. You could select a, a Bonferroni or a Tukey or a Dunne or a Schiffe. They're like differences in cars. They all get you to the same place. Whichever one you do select, it's going to do multiple group comparisons. In this case, it'll compare the means of group 1 and 2, 1 and 3, 1 and 4, 2 and 3, 2 and 4, and 3 and 4. In this case, it will do six separate little two-group comparisons. And each one of these little two-group comparisons are very similar to what we did in the two independent sample t-test. They're little two independent group analyses. It will tell us 
more specifically where the significant differences are. So you might see, you know, asterisk here, excuse me, um, you know, NS here, um, maybe an asterisk here, an asterisk here, NS here, uh, NS here, NS here. Asterisk implies, yeah, a null hypothesis was rejected at alpha O5. NS implies non-significant. We know that would imply P is greater than O5. So a typical research report, and this is just a little rough thing, I'm just jotting this up here, but you read the results of a scientific uh, journal article, and you know if they read, run one-way ANOVA and they have significant F, they will proceed to post hoc. You'll see Bonferroni or Chaffe, or you'll see it in just a ton of research articles. This is very, very popular uh, analysis. Now again, uh, we rejected the null, but there's a small chance that I may have uh, made a mistake in my decision to reject the null. We call this the likelihood of a type 1 error. It's about 5%. So there's a, about a 95% likelihood that I made the correct decision, which is pretty high. You know? And the likelihood I committed a type 2 error is just irrelevant at this point. Okay? This F apparently is a rare enough event to be deemed a significant event. Um, we rejected the null. Why were we able to reject the null? Because we had enough what? Power. Yeah. The four elements of power. Do you think I might ask you those questions again? Let's see how it applies. Well, let's start with alpha. Pretty standard alpha. We have the Toyota Corolla of alphas here. The Chevy Malibu of alphas. Pretty, pretty everyday occurrence, right? Nothing, you know. Okay. And to be honest with you, we don't have a whole lot of power here in our sample sizes. Don't have a whole lot of power going for us here. But as, as the analysis turned out, you know, we had enough between groups variation combined with not a whole lot of within groups variation, it actually produced an F that was statistically significant. So again, we had enough power to achieve significance. Yes? That would fall under within group variability, wouldn't it? Yes, within group variability, yeah. So again, the four elements of power, between groups variation, within groups variation, alpha, and sample size. So we call mean difference now, well, we have a new term. It's called between groups variation. Between groups variation, within groups variation, alpha, and sample size. Okay, um, that will conclude today's uh, lecture. I'm going to uh, actually give you, so that third problem that I told you we were going to, I'm just going to give you that for homework. Uh, happy studying. Have a great day and we will see you next session.